The Hiding Place by Corey Tenboom. Chapter 5 Invasion. The slender hands of the clock on the stair wall pointed to 925 as we left the dining room that night. That in itself was unusual in our orderly lives. Father was 80 years old now, and promptly at 8.45 each evening, an hour sooner than formerly, he would open the Bible, the signal for prayers, read one chapter, ask God's blessing on us through the night, and by 9.15, be climbing the stairs to his bedroom. Tonight, however, the Prime Minister was holding an address to the nation at 9.30. One question ached through all of Holland like a long-held breath. Would there be war? We circled up the steps to Tante Jan's rooms, and Father went to warm up the big table radio. We did not so often spend the evenings up here listening to music now. England, France, and Germany were at war. Their stations carried mostly war reports or code messages, and many frequencies were jammed. Even Dutch stations carried mostly war news, and that we could hear just as well on the small portable radio we kept now in the dining room, a gift from Pickwick the Christmas before. This, though, was to be a major broadcast. Somehow we all felt it merited the large old set with its elaborate speaker. We sat now waiting for 9.30, tense and upright in the high-backed wooden chairs, avoiding, as if by a kind of premonition, the cushioned and comfortable seats. Then the Prime Minister's voice was speaking to us, sonorous and soothing. There would be no war. He had had assurances from high sources on both sides. Holland's neutrality would be respected. It would be the Great War all over again. There was nothing to fear. Dutchmen were urged to remain calm and to... The voice stopped. Betsy and I looked up astonished. Father had snapped off the set, and in his blue eyes was a fire we had never seen before. It is wrong to give people hope where there is no hope, he said. It is wrong to base faith upon wishes. There will be war. The Germans will attack, and we will fall. He stamped out his cigar stub in the ashtray beside the radio, and with it, it seemed, the anger too, for his voice grew gentle again. Oh, my dears, I am sorry for all Dutchmen now who do not know the power of God, for we will be beaten, but he will not. He kissed us both good night, and in a moment, we heard the steps of an old man climbing the stairs to bed. Betsy and I sat rooted to our chairs. Father, so skilled at finding good in every situation, so slow to believe evil. If father saw war and defeat, then there was no other possibility at all. I sat bolt upright in my bed. What was that? There, there it was again. A brilliant flash followed a second later by an explosion which shook the bed. I scrambled over the covers to the window and leaned out. The patch of sky above the chimney tops glowed orange-red. I felt for my bathrobe and thrust my arms through the sleeves as I whirled down the stairs. At Father's room, I pressed my ear against the door. Between bomb bursts, I heard the regular rhythm of his breathing. I dived down a few more steps and into Tante Jan's room. Betsy had long since moved into Tante Jan's little sleeping cubicle, where she would be nearer the kitchen and the doorbell. She was sitting up in the bed. I groped toward her in the darkness, and we threw our arms around each other. Together, we said it aloud. War. It was five hours after the Prime Minister's speech. How long we clung together, listening, I do not know. The bombing seemed mostly to be coming from the direction of the airport. At last, we tiptoed uncertainly out to Tante Jan's front room. The glowing sky lit the room with a strange brilliance. The chairs, 
the mahogany bookcase, the old upright piano, all pulsed with an eerie light. Betsy and I knelt down by the piano bench. For what seemed like hours, we prayed for our country, for the dead and injured tonight, for the queen. And then, incredibly, Betsy began to pray for the Germans up there in the plains, caught in the fist of the giant evil loose in Germany. I looked at my sister kneeling beside me in the light of burning Holland. Oh Lord, I whispered, listen to Betsy, not me because I cannot pray for those men at all. And it was then that I had the dream. It couldn't have been a real dream because I was not asleep, but a scene was suddenly and unreasonably in my mind. I saw the groat market half a block away as clearly as though I were standing there, saw the town hall and St. Bravo's and the fish mart with all its stair-step facade. Then as I watched, kind of odd old farm wagon, old fashioned and out of place in the middle of the city, came lumbering across the square, pulled by four enormous black horses. To my surprise, I saw that I myself was sitting in the wagon and father too and Betsy. There were many others, some strangers, some friends. I recognized Pickwick and Twos, Wilhelm and young Peter, all together, we were slowly being drawn across the square behind those horses. We couldn't get off the wagon. That was the terrible thing. It was taking us away, far away, I felt. But we didn't want to go. Betsy, I cried, jumping up, pressing my hands to my eyes. Betsy, I've had such an awful dream. I felt her arm around my shoulder. We'll go down to the kitchen where the light won't show and we'll make a pot of coffee. The booming of the bombs was less frequent and farther away as Betsy put on the water. Closer by was the wail of fire alarms and the beep of the hose trucks. Over coffee, standing at the stove, I told Betsy what I had seen. Hey, am I imagining things because I'm frightened? But it wasn't like that, it was real. Oh, Betsy, was it a kind of vision? Betsy's fingers traced a pattern on the wooden sink worn smooth by generations of ten booms. I don't know, she said softly. But if God has shown us bad times ahead, it's enough for me that he knows about them. That's why he has sometimes shown us things, you know, to tell us that this too is in his hands. For five days, Holland held out against the invader. We kept the shop open, not because anyone was interested in watches, but because people wanted to see father. Some wanted him to pray for husbands and sons stationed at the border of the country. Others, it seemed to me, came just to see him sitting there behind his workbench, as he had for 60 years. And to hear in the ticking clocks, a world of order and reason, I never opened my workbench at all, but joined Betsy making coffee and carrying it down. We brought down the portable radio too and set it up on the display case. Radio was Harlem's eyes and ears and the very pulse rate. For after that first night, although we often heard planes overhead, the bombing never came so close again. The first morning over the radio came instructions that ground floor windows must be taped. Up and down the Bartlejorstrat, shop owners were out on the sidewalk. There was an unaccustomed neighborhood feel as advice, rolls of adhesive, and tales of the night's terror passed from door to door. One store owner, an outspoken anti-Semite, was helping Veal, the Jewish furrier, put up boards where a pane of glass had shaken loose. The optician next door to us, a silent, withdrawn individual, came over and taped the top of our display window where Betsy and I could not reach. A few nights later, the radio carried the news we dreaded. The queen had left. I had not cried the night of the invasion, but I cried now, for our country was lost. In the morning, the radio announced tanks advancing over the border, and suddenly all of Harlem was in the streets. 
Even Father, whose daily stroll was as predictable as his own clock chimes, broke his routine to go walking at the unheard hour of 10 a.m. It was as though we wanted to face what was coming together. The whole city united, as though each would draw strength from each other Hollander. And so the three of us walked, jostled by the crowd, over the bridge on the Sparn, all the way to the great wild cherry tree, whose blossoms each spring formed such a white glory that it was called the Bride of Harlem. A few faded petals clung now to the new leafed branches, but most of the bride's flowers had fallen, forming a wilted carpet beneath us. A window down the street flew open. We've surrendered! The procession in the street stopped short. Each told his neighbor what we had all heard for ourselves. A boy of maybe 15 turned to us with tears rolling down his cheeks. I would have fought. I wouldn't ever have given up. Father stooped down to pick up a small bruised petal from the brick pavement. Tenderly, he inserted it into his buttonhole. This is good, my son, he told the youngster, for Holland's battle has just begun. And I think we'll pause here and continue reading this next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thank you so much for listening. I love you guys. Bye-bye.